please give a hand to Dr. Wolfgang Fink. <clears throat> Can you hear me well? Okay, it's maybe a little bit too loud. So, okay. Well, thank you very much for being here tonight. It's a pleasure. And I would like to, before we get started, um, extend my thank you to uh, Shepard Reed and Neil and the Flanders Science Center for organizing this. <laughs> also, I would like to acknowledge my student, Alex Wynn Brooks, right here. Yes. And uh, since we mentioned the Edward and, Kionjian, uh, Edward and Maria Kionjian in our chair, we are very honored to have Maria Kionjian, the widow, with us tonight. Maria, please, can you? Thank you. Okay, so without further ado, I think everyone should be familiar with Star Wars one way or the other. It's one of those rare movie sagas which has been spanning over four decades, actually. And the funny part is, newborns to 99 plus, everyone's intimately familiar with Star Wars. It's just amazing. It's on toothbrush, toothpaste, everywhere. You can find it. So without further ado, what we will do is we'll look at some technologies which were already proclaimed or forecast 40 years ago, and we'll see what the counterparts are nowadays. Um, I will also take the liberty to tie some of that, what we're seeing, to my own research in my lab, the Visual and Autonomous Exploration Systems Research Laboratory. So without further ado, um, we start with the big stuff first. So everyone's familiar with the Death Star. It didn't last past the first movie, but um, you know the story, how it goes. And so there's some counterparts to that. One in nature, which is actually the Saturn moon uh, Mimas, which you see right here. And there's this big impact crater, which is not the super weapon. It's an impact crater. You see the central peak and the in impact and the overturned bedding and the rim of the crater. So it's a pretty big crater. Um, of course, the uh, Death Star was basically a space station. Very sophisticated um, and planet-like. What we have so far is the International Space Station, of course, and we had a precursor, which was the Mir Space Station uh, on the Russian side, and of course the Chinese are also building on their space station, so it's getting pretty crowded up there in, in orbit. But nevertheless, we do have a space station. The only thing we do not have, and that's pretty much a problem with all of science fiction movies, is artificial gravity. There's only one exception, which is Odyssey 2001. They got it right. So everything was spinning as a result of that. Um, so if we take a look inside uh, the Death Star, then obviously the throne room of the Emperor, there was this elaborate window. And we have actually something very similar on the International Space Station as of late. Uh, there's a, I hope you can see it, it's a little bit dark, but it's a multifaceted window, it's called a cupola on the ISS, which can be uh, used for viewing Earth and um, having sort of direct observations. And you can literally sit in front of it and behind the window and look out into outer space. Now coming, of course, to the weapon. Um, there's a few things to be said about this. So obviously, um, it was a pretty high-powered laser beam. And so in some instances, we're catching up with Star Wars, what was already done 40 years ago. In some instances, though, we're sort of lagging behind, maybe for the better, maybe for the worse, we'll see. But um, just want to point out two things. One is the National Ignition Facility, which is a national lab, um, which basically has as, as its charter to create a laser beam compri comprised of many, many lasers, high-powered lasers, in the 500 terawatt regime and beyond to basically fire it on hydrogen atoms to basically create a fusion. And then so that would be another way of getting towards a fusion reactor, which hopefully will then give us sustainable energy supply. Um, so, of course, something like this could be also used in different ways. You could have uh, space-based mirrors, in which case you could redirect such a laser beam for maybe not so nice tasks. Um, but of course you could also use it for energy supply across the, um, the Earth to especially remote areas. Um, more practical for now is something down here, which you can see here is a laser gun, a laser weapon system, 
on board of one of the um, USS cruisers and I want to give you a quick um, demo of this thing. So I have to apologize, I have to get back out of the uh, PowerPoint. So. And for some of you who are sitting close to the loudspeaker, now might be a good time to close your ears a little bit. So. So here you see the uh, high-powered infrared laser. It's in the non-visible. Here you see the target. And here you see the shot fired onto the target. So, that's obviously not a planet which is being destroyed, but it's a target nevertheless. And also, if you look into the Geneva Convention, um, laser weapons, especially rifle-based, are actually prohibited because you really would not see this thing coming. It's completely invisible and you would be blind in a fraction of a second or worse. Okay, so we're going back to the presentation. So I hope I was able to convince you. So efforts are being made both for the good and for the worse to use laser weapons. And of course, our all-time favorites are the spaceship, if I can get them going. So here we are. Here's a selection of um, the TIE fighters, the X-Wing fighters, and of course, uh, the Death Star out of the third movie in the old um, numeration. Um, what's interesting is that the movies actually almost to the date, or to the day itself, was May 25, 21st, 25th in 77, 80 in 83. And the only thing we have actually to show for now, for us, is the space shuttle, as a matter of fact, and a few modifications. And that one launched actually in 81, so even after the second movie launched. And um, of course, since the space shuttle is now retired, we're looking forward to the Dragon capsule, uh, we're looking to s forward to SpaceX um, and other um, endeavors to give us spacecraft. But of course, they're not like what we're used to in the science fiction movies just yet. Nevertheless, as you saw in one of the latest movies, Count Dooku's elegant uh, spaceship had actually a solar sail. And that seemed pretty futuristic. It's nice to look at, as a matter of fact. And um, lo and behold, NASA launched a mission, the NanoSail D mission, which tested out exactly such a solar sail. Just to give you a quick uh, rundown on this, a solar sail is basically a very thin foil. It's reflective. And so all the photons, even though they have no mass at rest, once they're in motion, though, and they hit the solar sail from behind, they leave, they get reflected and leave an impulse, which they transfer onto the spacecraft. So you can very slowly, but surely and continuously start accelerating. And since there's not much drag out in space, you can actually get some meaningful speed and propel yourself through the universe without having to burn your own fuel. Of course, everyone's familiar with the walkers, right, which were first deployed on the ice planet Hoth. And um, so there's, that's where it becomes a little bit scary because there's actually a counterpart to that by Boston Dynamics called the Big Dog. And there's another one which is even scarier called the Spot. And I want to show you what the system looks like and then you can start sort of getting some chills, <coughs> if you will. because it's pretty amazing what these um, systems actually are able to, to do already. And you have to keep in mind that these systems for now do not carry any weapons. And that's where it becomes scary. So there's no cable, it's all self-contained. So 
let me go to the outdoors. See some robot abuse already, which reminds us of iRobot, right? Do robots have rights or not? But you see how this, how this thing recovers, which is absolutely amazing. And now it can go through rugged terrain, can traverse pretty much anything. And let's see. So this is now highly rugged terrain. And seems pretty unstoppable. And now if you think you can outrun it on stairs, then you have to think again. It's actually negotiating the stairs quite well. So these systems are usually equipped with LiDARs, which are laser rangefinders, and of course they have their onboard power supply, and you see it can actually run also. So it's a pretty scary uh, prospect. Good, so now let's go back to our presentation. Okay, so those were the walkers for you. And of course, my personal all-time favorites, which are, in my opinion, the real stars of the entire Star Wars saga, C-3PO and R2-D2. So humanoid-type robots. Well, here's the Boston Dynamic equivalent, and I will show uh, two of them in action. And here you see the whole history of development of the so-called ASIMO robot by um, Honda. And you see how it started in 86, actually shortly after the movies, the first three, and then the development towards the humanoid form. And I definitely want to show you what these systems look like when they walk. And I have to apologize that I have to switch out of the PowerPoint, but it does not directly play. Okay, so here we go. This is now the Atlas, second generation. Also no cable. <coughs> so it's <coughs> even walking through a snowy surface or the forest, actually, in this case. And you will see soon how it recovers from sort of uncertain steps and missteps. So it looks like a little drunk here, but uh, still it's it kind of... it, it managed. Let's see. It's pretty amazing. What you see up here is actually a laser rangefinder. So now in unison with a uh, human counterpart. So it can be used in a warehouse, as you can see. And now we'll see what, what the bad human does to the good robot in a second. But you see, it, it recovers pretty nicely, and so real, m yeah. <laughs> it it does not yet complain, which is the good part. So that's that's next. That's called autonomy then. So, okay, now we get to the real brutal part, coming from behind. It's really not nice, right? So this is actually real brutal. <laughs> but you see, it's the system does not give up. So, you can imagine, if that thing had something else other than a water pistol in its hand, you better run. Okay, so that's human robots for you. Yeah. Okay, so with that, I want to give you a quick uh, view, and we'll get back to Star Wars in a second, of some of my research in the realm of robotics. Um, what we do is exploration of uh, space targets, which are of high interest. So you have the Moon, you have Enceladus, uh, you have Earth, Mars, Venus, 
and Titan. Those are all bodies which may have had life at some point or could still harbor life. We're thinking of microbes, so we're not thinking of green mass men running around. But um, those actually still hold a lot of secrets which need to be explored. In order to get there, we devised a new concept for space exploration tier, um, called tier scalable reconnaissance. And uh, just to give you a quick overview, orbiters in the past have been circling planets, so they give you a wonderful overview of the entire planet, but at the expense of local detail. Um, a rover, on the other hand, here you see Curiosity, and you see the Phoenix lander, uh, which was actually um, operated by University of Arizona. Um, those are very local reconnaissance agents, because especially the lander can only explore what's in the vicinity of the reach of its arm. So we came up with a concept, so forget all this part, I could talk a whole hour on this alone, but just focus on the middle part. We're looking at an integrated system, which consists of orbiters, aerial platforms, if the planet supports an atmosphere, and ground units, which are small and expendable, but more in number. That's the idea. So the idea is instead of having one ton of a rover, you have maybe 100 or 50, 20 kilogram rovers, so you can afford putting them into areas which are high risk. Some of them may not make it, but a few will make it and give you the real science where it actually is. In canyons, cracks, crevices, that's where the real science lies. So if you think that was pie in the sky, it's not. There's actually military counterparts. Raytheon, for example, has a uh, T-SAT architecture, also consisting of satellites, AVAX systems, and airborne systems, helicopters, and ground. So these are manned, meaning those are human operated, whereas the other part, what we are working on, is completely self-contained, fully autonomously operated. Deployment scenarios are Mars, for example, an orbiter, aerial platform, ground units, or Titan. Titan is interesting because Titan is the only planetary body uh, which actually has lakes, but they're not made of water, they're made of hydrocarbons, methane and ethane. It's so cold that these gases are actually liquid. So we have to look into robotic platforms which can both traverse the uh, actual soil and also the lake bodies. So what we did is we started building a robotic test bed and we started small, started with a tiny little toy which fit in the palm of your hand, but it was a bare proof of concept. Encouraged by that, we came up with bigger platforms which now actually can have a full-blown Unix workstation, so basically a very high-powered computer on board and can do a lot of number crunching tasks. And I want to show you an example. Here is Cyclops, which we also used for some other research, um, which is vision related. But here's a video which we put together in the wake of Wally. -E. So here you see the camera. The Macintosh computer is inside. This um, system can be computer controlled worldwide. If the robot has internet access over in Europe, we have internet access here, we can drive it from here, right here, okay. device, and get the data sent back. Even like that. Anyway, so that was a lot of fun, but we also realized that with this system, we cannot really go in the outdoors, but we did make it at least to the red carpet event of Ball A, so that was good. Mission accomplished. So here's now the third generation of rovers we actually came up with, and we have actually two of them right here with us, which we can look at after the talk. So those are very capable platforms. Um, they can have a lot of sensors on board to control themselves and to explore certain areas. And as you can see, they're also quite mobile. So this one was actually scaling that big boulder by itself. So I don't want to show you what happened one second after, but you can imagine. So. Nevertheless, it's strong enough for me to sit on it and actually drive around. So this is a serious robotic system. As I mentioned, Titan, Titan has liquid lakes. So we also looked into building a robotic explorer for lakes. So this is a, uh, obviously a catamaran design. And this is the actual cat drawing of it. And we built the whole thing from scratch. We deployed it at Tucson's beautiful Riviera, which is one of the irrigation lakes of Silver Bell Lake. <laughs> you don't want to put your hand in that. But anyways, um, so we deployed it and uh, we're in hot pursuit of a duck. So we reached not warp speed, but duck speed. 
And uh, so what's interesting about it is, though, you don't want to be faster than the duck because what you cannot see is there's a little rope here or cable which leads to a sonar system which is being towed. And once you have a sonar system, you do not want to be faster than five miles an hour because otherwise you don't get the returning signal, you're way ahead. So it would be useless. Again, all these agents can be controlled worldwide with iPads, iPhones, iPods um, through the internet. And one of the next stages is going to be to have these ground agents controlled from an airborne perspective, in which case it will be a um, blip. So this part I will not go into too much, but this is the whole setup of how you automatically reason about images which you gather and then coming up with your own decision where to go next. So the machine makes the decisions instead of the human operator. Coming back to Star Wars. Well, everyone's familiar and probably would love to have one, the sand glider on Tatooine, right? So you have this jet engine and it was nicely levitating, um, so it was a perfect tool. So here we have made some strides, but we're still lagging behind. So here's the system, the Aero X. It has basically two large propellers here, and you can get, I think, about 20, 30 miles an hour out of it. Um, but it doesn't last that long, obviously, because it has to have all the power on board. So at this point, you may, instead of batteries, potentially use fuel which is then not too elegant, but um, you have to do it in order to levitate and then move forward. A cheaper version, which you can actually buy, is this Aka board, which is basically this board right here with a lot of fans and the rest right here, all LiPo batteries. Um, so you can actually hover on that board and sort of work your way through the street into the next car. And um, hopefully not, uh, but anyway, so this, is sort of a counterpart of what we come up with to sort of mimic this. But as you can see, it's rather crude and not nearly as elegant, but we're getting there. Lightsaber duels often go wrong, right? As you can see here, oops, why is there? Oops, yeah, here it is, no? Okay, there was supposed to be another picture, it didn't come up. Um, Luke also lost his right hand in the second movie, The Empire Strikes Back. Um, got chopped off by Darth Vader, by his father. And um, Count Dooku chopped off Anakin Skywalker's arm. So again, the problem was you lost a limb and now you needed to be mobile again in no time. And uh, Star Wars has shown how to do that very quickly. And um, But there's now efforts out there, especially driven by DARPA and uh, the Defense Department of Defense, to actually come up with prosthetic devices which become ever more sophisticated. They started out extremely crude, basically like just two hands sort of clapping together and grabbing something, but now you get things which can be mind controlled. Um, the way that works is, it, for example, right here on this lady, you see there's actually an implant in the brain and it taps into the cortex of the person and records signals which would otherwise be then executed by your muscles to then grab a cup of water or a drink uh, and they are going to be um, recorded and then transported into a robotic system so that this lady can now with her mind control this entire arm which is highly articulated. And of course, as you can see, this one doesn't look really that elegant, looks somewhat scary, but at least it's functional. This one looks a lot better actually. And this one now is one of the latest um, inventions by the guy who came up with the Segway. And as you can see, if you were to color it differently, it would actually almost look like an arm. So it doesn't have this mechanical um, structure or, or look anymore. And what's interesting is you can also implement tactile sensors. You get actually tactile feedback that you get the feedback that you're grabbing something. And that's really very novel. So in other words, it will not be as simple as what Star Wars has been showing, but we're, we're getting there. And so with that, I want to get to the last part of the talk. And since I've been working in prosthetic systems as well, in my particular case, we have been working on implants for blind people. 
just to give you a quick rundown, some of you may be familiar with two diseases, either amongst your relatives or otherwise. There's the age-related macular degeneration and retinitis pigmentosa. Especially retinitis pigmentosa is a disease which is inherited and leads to blindness. There's no cure. It can affect children as much as adults. Um, age-related macular degeneration usually occurs later in age. What happens is lights coming into the eye and then hits the back of the eye known as the retina. So the retina is right here in a cross section, but forget about the graph. Think about the retina as a wedding cake, a layered wedding cake. Lights coming from the top through all the layers of the cake to hit the bottom. And the bottom part is where the rods and cones are, which you're all familiar with. Those rods and cones actually take the light, convert it to electrochemical signals, and then these signals travel up through the top layers of the cake, get processed, and then enter the brain, and then ultimately generate what we call vision. The, these two diseases wipe out the bottom part of that cake, which means the rods and cones are gone, people go blind. The good news is, amongst the bad news, that you still have the rods and cones, the, the remaining layers of the retina, to, which are somewhat intact. And because of that, People have been implanting either on top of the retina, beneath the retina, or further below electric chips, which can then stimulate electrically the retina to give you some basic vision back. All of you can do this experiment yourself when you go to bed tonight and you rub your eyes. If you rub a little bit too hard, you will see a light flash coming up. And interestingly enough, it comes exactly across, diagonally across to where you put your pressure onto the eyeball. And so that is a way of how you can stimulate vision through mechanical pressure. The same can happen with electric stimulation, and that's what people have been using. The implant project which I've been involved with is the so-called Argus 2. And you see right here the chip, it's a 60 electrode chip, and you, it seems like it's sitting on top of the retina, and it is actually. So it, it's um, about five millimeter by five millimeter across. Here you see the chip. It's implanted and it's driven by a camera from the outside. So what happens is, this was a large effort, by the way. Um, there were several national labs involved, uh, several universities. And here's the basic um, setup for this. Patients wear a camera. The camera takes images wherever they turn their head in real time. The images get processed on an external processing unit and then ultimately uh, show or transmit the images to the chip which sits on the retina and then stimulates the retina electrically. And so in order to show this, I want to... So give me one second. So rather than going for the slide, I want to show this to you in real time, if I can. Okay, so I have my camera image right here. So this used to be a state-of-the-art, which is just 4x4. Four four. So I have the camera built into the laptop, so you see nothing, pretty much. But if you go back to a higher resolution, 8x8, or for the sake of the argument, let's make it a 32x32, 32 32, you can start making out the silhouette of a person and maybe you see a hand waving. That's basically the state of the art of what current implants can roughly do. And now in real time, we can uh, throw in certain filters in order to make this. Um, hold on, just do this. So we can throw in certain filters to make the experience for the patient um, to the point where it's most useful for them. So they wear the camera, we can play with the filters and reach a level which is then most useful for the patient. And so that's all happening in real time on this laptop. And what's interesting about it is that we were able to convert this 
So you can run on iPhone, an iPad, or an iPod. So you can do the entire image processing necessary for such an implant on your own phone. And with that, only one more thing to say, may the force be with you, always. Thank you.